So otters and ospreys are, are generally, genuinely um, a really good symbol of targeted removal of significantly damaging chemicals from the countryside. Um, so yeah, genuine good news story. Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I speak to Alastair Driver about ospreys and otters, both as tangible examples of what we can achieve when we take action to save a species. But we also talk about how on earth we can fund the ambitious targets for rewilding in Britain. Everything from philanthropy to corporate offsetting, but even how the osprey itself can help make rewilding pay. Alistair Driver, I'm the director of Rewilding Britain. Um, so Alistair, thank you very much for coming yeah, on, our, uh, on our podcast, on our show. I wanted to chat to you about your views on ospreys in general. Uh, yeah, just fantastic bird, charismatic and a great icon, actually, for healthy rivers, waterways, lakes, etc. And and of course, we, we've got a long way to go on that in Britain. But the fact that the osprey is returning partly of its own accord and partly through supplemental reintroductions. So for me, you know, it's a... It's an iconic bird in its own right, wonderful symbol of of healthy uh, lakes and rivers and estuaries. And uh, I've spent most of my life working in river and wetland conservation anyway. So it's, you know, it's absolutely a keystone species for for the work that I've had the privilege of focusing on. So, yeah. Yeah. And good for you for uh, tracking these things so we can learn more about the problems along the way on their migrations. And what do you think has happened well, over, I guess you said mentioned 45 years, in 45 years, their habitats have, or potential habitats have changed. How would you describe those? Yeah, I, well, there's a, there's a few things there. And, and, and I think it's a bit like otter conservation, that there are some very particular elements of their conservation, which had a, or non-conservation of the, uh, um, of their eradication, if you like, which which had a massive impact, and um, and so obviously persecution was a big deal. Um, so so the the fact that we're no longer persecuting them, or at least it's minimal now, um, is a, is a very important uh, factor. The, in southern Britain, our waterways are not significantly better in water quality terms than they were 20 years ago. Uh, we know that because we've got had the Water Framework Directive, which um, forced us to do, you know, root, you know, proper routine monitoring. And, and there's very little overall progress. But um, the removal of toxic persistent pesticides and the, the removal, more or less removal of persecution in this country, then supplemented by well-targeted, well-thought-through introductions, you know that is the reason they turn things around and there are enough fish and food in the system to support many more pairs of osprey than we've got at the moment there's no reason why we couldn't have ospreys on virtually all of the major water bodies in this country so um so i i do talk to rewilding landowners about that and in fact the very last site that i was at graithwaite estate in cumbria They've uh, now this is a site that is now embarking on the rewilding journey, but their estate includes Ethwaite water, and on their estate they have three breeding pairs of osprey on one estate in England, wow. uh, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, that that's not because of the rewilding because they haven't really started, but it shows they can survive, uh, and if we start rewilding and make, making the landscape even healthier then who knows what the productivity and the expansion of the population might be. And you just mentioned the, the, in the, the changes in the environment that there's a removal of a particular sort of pesticide. 
toxic persistent pesticides did you say can you mm. describe that in a bit more detail well well i'm not i'm not, I'm not an expert in that field but um toxic persistent pesticides are are things that we're using obviously to kill to kill wildlife deliberately right. pests, yeah. the, things we call pests and they the, the persistent bit is what's important because they do not break down easily in soil and water and so they get taken up by species in the food chain and in the case of uh, water it's fish that take them up and store them in their organs and then the birds of prey will then predate on those fish and then they get this buildup of these pesticides transferred into their systems and initially certainly in the case of otters for example that rendered otters infertile and then in, ex in more extreme uh, levels of uh, pesticide poisoning it literally killed them and that's why that's the main reason why we lost otters from the vast majority of england so otters and ospreys are are generally genuinely um a really good symbol of targeted removal of significantly damaging chemicals from the countryside um so yeah genuine good news story great and that would have been used as general pesticides for crops and things as opposed to particular baits targeting predators which is what we've been speaking to people about in spain for example yeah absolutely this is this is general pesticide use in the countryside mainly to kill pests and you know things like invertebrates etc but of course that then washes off into waterways um, builds up in sediment builds up in uh invertebrates in in waterways and then in fish and then in the things that eat the fish and so you've obviously been working with people in conservation, different people over that time as well. Has there been a significant shift in uh, how welcome the osprey is amongst different people, whether that's landowners who might want fish for fishing or whether that's uh, uh, people that own the kind of fishing rights and might want uh, might not want to have ospreys taking some of their fish? Has there been a change or has there always been an acceptance that the ospreys will be around and they'll take some fish? Well, I, I can only really speak for England and Wales, where I spent the vast majority of my life. Um, so maybe attitudes in Scotland were different, I don't know. But throughout my lifetime, seeing an osprey was all, always going to be a source of joy and excitement, you know, for people I have, have known. And, not, and I don't just mean bird watchers and environmentalists so so i think there was there was probably quite a gap between the you know the relentless persecution the deliberate persecution that would have would have happened maybe a hundred years ago yeah and and the removal of the pesticide issue um uh, and then the recovery of the osprey so there's, there's quite a long time frame between those things so i think our our attitudes towards ospreys generally in southern Britain had improved markedly by the time you got into, say, the 60s and 70s when, you know, when I was brought up. So, so yeah, I, I think generally speaking, they've been a very popular bird now because it is very popular. Um, most people love them. Most you know, people spend a lot of money to go and, you know, to pay to go and see them, you know, in um, Bot Garden, places like that. Um, so so it is it is uh, an ideal symbol because there's relatively little controversy around them um compared to other birds of prey for example yeah i mean they're, they're less controversial much less controversial than say white teal white tailed eagles even though actually white tailed eagles would eat quite a lot of fish and, and scavenge a lot as well um so um so yeah it's a it's a night it's it's a for me it's a bit like say beaver and pine martin compared compared with wolf for example, you know, where where in this country, sadly, um, yeah. it's going to be virtually impossible in in the short to medium term to get that species back because of public perceptions. Um, with osprey, I think you're kind of pushing against an open door, really. Every yeah, and we've even seen I mean, one of the projects we visited on the way uh, down from Scotland on this expedition was it's kind of last minute contact uh, was from the Bolton Castle estate. Uh, who had put up a couple of osprey nests a couple of years ago in hope they'd noticed ospreys scoping and they were just excited that well, they'd had advice from Kielda and from Roy Dennis I think and a few others yeah. and based on that knowledge and the knowledge of the I guess the 
local team who were primarily gamekeepers um they had made a plan for the kind of two sites where they thought an osprey might like a nest and had put them up and yeah within two years they had nest and breeding ospreys and they were really excited about it but it was great to see that excitement coming from everybody from the kind of the heads yeah. of the estate uh down to the uh down to the workers and even the the walkers and people in the in the surrounding area it yeah, was yeah, yeah re really exciting as a symbol of if you like make a little bit of effort um you can generate quite a big change yeah, and one and one important link there is um, with rewilding projects is that um, re rewilding involves basically involves taking pressures off the land, like intensive grazing, for example, removing removing man made activities that are damaging to the environment. That's the first step. Allowing natural regeneration, removing applications of pesticides and chemicals, etc and where appropriate introducing species but then so what you're doing as part of many rewilding projects is you are not then relying entirely on uh, farming and food production and you know you haven't got all your eggs in one basket the food production basket you then start diversifying and nature tourism is a very very common aspect of these rewilding projects now for for, for successful nature tourism Yes, it's great to have attractive landscapes, but ideally you want charismatic species that people can see. And, and the osprey fits the bill perfectly for that. Um, so that's why species like pine martin, uh, water vole, uh, golden eagle, osprey, beaver, they crop up a lot in, in the wish lists, as it were, for, for a lot of these sites. You know, these are the species they want to see back anyway. But they know they will add value value to the economics of of the rewilding project, which basically they because it's rewilding has to be long term. They, they've basically got to commit to it for multi gener you know, for cross across generations. Uh, yeah, and it's I guess it's nice that you can see some bits of change that are happening really quickly. So on this whole migration, we've repeatedly been coming across ways that we hadn't realised the private sector and what they do, what they don't do, is intricately uh, connected to the survival of the birds, and that's in in different places. How? What do? You, what's your views on the role that the private sector are or could be uh, playing in rewilding and bringing back species? Yeah, uh, uh, private sector has got a very significant role to play, and we, we're already seeing examples of. Uh, first of all, philanthropic individuals who've made money through business um, contributing to um, land acquisition and land management for rewilding uh, for charities. We at Rewilding Britain, we don't own land and uh, acquire land, but we will connect um, such people with with various other organisations and individual projects. And that is, that is already happening. So that's like a, a philanthropic aspect. Um, then there is the direct biodiversity offsetting, uh, uh, which is starting to gather momentum. It's not compulsory, but but that is starting to happen. Um, and there is scope there for individual businesses to offset the impacts of their business through engaging in rewilding projects. And sometimes that might involve the reintroduction of species. Remember, species reintroduction is just one of many interventions to enable rewilding to happen um and and then we have for example developments will pay for re what could pay for rewilding type activity through biodiversity net gain through the planning process now that usually probably wouldn't involve species reintroduction but it might enable a site mm. to be rewilded which then makes it suitable for species reintroduction so so these this private investment is very significant and what we're saying to government is Look, you've got this environmental land management scheme. That's great. Um, in the top tier of that scheme, the landscape recovery component, it, that is exactly where private investment might be utilised to complement existing, you know, the public funding that would be allocated to that component. Because that's that's where you know the, these investors and these businesses they want to see large scale, um, very very uh, ambitious, uh, significant transformational change in the landscape and if they can go and visit a restored valley a whole valley 
and look across it and see ospreys on the lake and golden eagles on the crag and pine martins in the woods down below then you know that that for them is is the ultimate goal so absolutely we're going to see more and more of this and are you seeing that that want from the private sector um to see significant change does that come in areas well, only in areas where they already have an impact so on landscapes where they know that their business hasn't has uh, a negative effect they want to be making up for that or or is it is it bigger than that is it more sim simply that they'd actually like to be making a positive change on the environment and want to see it happen I, on a yeah i think yeah, certainly um certainly with with the sort of business offsetting i think generally speaking it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be on land where they are because they'd realize that they'd like to get more bang for their buck further further afield where there's more space for example because a lot of these businesses might be based in cities for example and it's difficult to to find the space to do significant landscape scale change for nature so um so on the one hand they'd want to see it where it's where it's delivering you know the most value for money um making the most difference on the other hand some of them will want to be able to visit those sites and they want their staff to go and take part in a some volunteering activity planting a few trees or or um, doing some monitoring of it reintroduced ospreys or something like that you know so so um i i guess it will depend on the the individuals but i don't if if they want to be constrained to where they're operating then that, that that's a big that's going to hamper the the options significantly and Give us a give us a percentage split on those decisions. To what percentage of uh, that decision making is done on hard business numbers, and what percentage of those decisions do you think are made from an individual whose heart is somehow moved to want to make a difference in the world? Well, at the moment, at the moment, the vast majority of those people are people who. Are who are philanthropic they have lots of money uh, as individuals and they want to and they now want to put something back that that's the way it is at the moment but i foresee a time within 10 years when the vast majority of this activity will be business coordinated business offsetting yeah. um, and we got to make sure that those businesses don't use it as an excuse just to carry on doing bad things of course there has to be you know a given that they are going to continually strive to be more environmentally friendly uh, as as time passes, but I I don't have any problem with understanding that principle applies. I don't have any problem with that level of investment increasing significantly, and I think it will. Thank you very much, Alastair. Um, it's been a pleasure. Good to talk to yeah. you again, Patrick.